Welcome to the Lipedema podcast hosted by Shell and Tiana. Our aim is to make noise around lipedema and educate as many people as we can about this disease. Our guest list contains professionals who work in the field and women who live with lipedema. Thank you for joining us. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Tiana today. Tiana is a co-host on the Lipedema podcast. Tiana is a 36-year-old wife and mother of two of twin girls. She comes from a performing arts background, but is now working in public service as an executive manager. Tiana is living with lymphedema and stage two lipedema in her arms and legs and is passionate about spreading awareness and sharing her journey through her Instagram page. Me and my lipedema. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tiana. Yay, Shell. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, without a doubt, you would be, well, episode three. Come on, we're right Woo-hoo! up there at the top. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> All right, so I've done a bit of an intro. We've done episode zero where we got to know a little bit about you. Is there something else you want to tell us about you? Um, I guess I want to preface this whole conversation uh, with when I'm talking, if I ever talk about body image and poor body image, that is under the lens of my lived experience in professional dancing. And so the standards held for what a body is supposed to look like in that space is very different to the normal world so you may see me on my Instagram page and I do get some comments that my body doesn't look that affected um and uh I I take on I take those comments on board but my my lived experience is in the world of professional dance where I am compared to natural size six to eights uh, and I am a natural size 12, standard size 12. So, um, yes, but that's all I want to say about that. So let's okay. get into it. I, I also, I want to point out what you said then, and this is a bit of a bugbear of mine, is someone saying someone is less affected than someone else. Like it, it's the same with anything in life. It's, Everything is different for each individual. And the more we can advocate for those at the earlier stages, the more successful we're going to be in not having to rely on disability pensions and disabled stickers for cars and mobility when we're older. So we when we progress. So that that really annoys me that someone would say that you are less affected. I don't, I think there needs to be a lot more stage one, just we need to get more stage one girls out there showing what the early signs look like. Because I think that's the issue here. And that, oh, I'm taking over your interview now <laughs> because like I didn't find out till I was 48 because I, and even then I only see the fully progressed stages of lipedema you don't see enough of those early stages when we can do something about it so I am so sorry that someone has said that to you and that is yeah unacceptable unacceptable oh thank you I I totally take your point um it is very important to be able to highlight those earlier stages where we can get on the front foot of the disease But I often see, not just in lipedema, but other chronic illnesses, uh, you're only paid attention to when you are in the serious stages of progression. And it's almost like um, I'm not diseased enough to get what I need for the rest of my life. And, um, And that affects so many of the chronic illness community out there. So, um... We're not, we're not for that at the Lipedema podcast. We mm-hmm. are for education at any stage. So come along with us. <laughs> yes, thank you. We sure are. Yeah, yeah, that, that really upsets me. And, and it resonates with me because like I've, throughout my life, I've always been a big girl, but like I was too curvy to be 
in, in one camp and I wasn't curvy enough to be in the other. So I was sort of stuck in no man's land. <laughs> Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, a lot of us are in that limbo stage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the fringe dwellers, I call myself. We're the fringe dwellers. <laughs> I love it. I will use that. Okay, back to you. How did you come to learn about lipedema? Yeah, so social media, actually, um, which is sort of why uh, I've, I've now put myself out there on social media because I understand that it's such an accessible platform um, and it can be really powerful if we have the courage to tell our stories. Um, so I was doom scrolling Instagram uh, reels as you do at ridiculous hours of the night when you can't sleep. And I came across the Lipedema Mama um, and she had a reel that was like, uh, do you have column shaped legs? Do you have excess cellulite? And a few other things that I really resonated with and then uh, the last part of it was you might have lipedema and I'd never heard of that word before in my life so I clicked on her uh, page and that really started the um, perpetual motion of finding out more information about lipedema and at first um, with the information that I was receiving in that there was, you know, the messaging was that there's no cure, um, that surgery is our only uh, real option and that it's very expensive and all out of pocket. I sort of thought to myself that I wouldn't bother getting a diagnosis and I was going to just live with my own knowledge that this is what I was dealing with. Um, it was all very overwhelming to uh, try and gather the information myself. And I really did lean on uh, the community on social media. And we are very lucky in Australia to have Lipedema Australia, which is, I believe, a not-for-profit organisation who are doing such great things to advocate for and to educate women. Um, so that was my first point of call when I was really looking for information and I joined their private Facebook group and a few other community pages as well. Um, it, got to the, it got to the stage where um, some, you know, when you have a, a good day and you have a bad day or you have a, a string of good days and you're feeling good in your body and and I was on a string of good days and I thought, well, maybe I don't have this. Maybe I'm just not good at losing weight or maybe I'm just not supposed to look smaller than I am now or maybe I just do have excess cellulite. Um, and it got me a little bit more enthused to try and seek definitive answers. So I'm not on the Gold Coast, but the Gold Coast is probably... Uh, the closest uh, to me in terms of specialists that are advertising online that they know and treat and help manage lipedema. So I got in touch with Lipedema Surgical Solutions and went through their process to seek a diagnosis. And that diagnosis was uh, stage two lipedema uh, in my legs and my arms and uh, I have a bit in my abdomen as well. But the thing about my abdomen is that I am through in pregnancy and my skin really didn't bounce back. So it's very difficult to tell whether it's just um, the skin issue from my uh, pregnancy or whether there is some lipedema in there. And you know, I think it could be a little bit of both. Yeah. <clears throat> So how long between when you heard the word lipedema and were doom scrolling to diagnosis? Yeah, so I found out um, about the word lipedema in November of last year. So the same as you, Shell. And my diagnosis I received in late January this year uh, when I was on annual leave. I thought I'd take the time during my annual leave to um, really go through the uh, process of diagnosis. And prior to 
finding out about this, had you ever thought any advice on your legs or did you just think that was just who you were? Like, because you did say like you are a professional dancer. So you were in this dance world where your legs did not measure up to the other dancers. But did you think that was just you or had you tried to get some answers, trying to figure it out? Yeah, certainly um, I always wondered why my body looked different to others and I sort of um, swapped between, well, that's just the way I am and then between I'm not working hard enough. So uh, depending where my mindset was at the time, it would be, oh, well, that's just the way my body is and then on other days I'd be like, well, I'm obviously doing something wrong. Um, and I see, you know, girls and women dancers who go and uh, eat cheeseburgers after their show or um, they're having lollies during the show and that was not my experience or if it was my experience, then I would see the repercussions of it very soon after. And I thought, gee, they must not be eating in their spare time. Like I don't, and it doesn't add up to me. So um when I stopped dancing full time, uh, I knew that I would have a problem with weight management um, and I was still dancing part time. So the expectation to fit into costumes was still there, but I wasn't in shows all day and my body wasn't moving all day long. So I went to the doctor and I said, look, I've stopped dancing full time and um, I'm really nervous about putting on weight because it seems to be my experience that that's quite easy for me to do. And he was this, this older um, gentleman and he goes, exercise more, eat less. And then he sort of like he was giving me the wisdom and then he shuffled me <laughs> off and I was like, thanks so much. Oh dear, I'm in a, a lot of trouble. So <sighs> there on started the, uh, the uh, dieting um and look, I wasn't great at dieting, to be honest, uh, because I didn't eat unhealthily anyway. And yeah. those small things that brought me joy or helped me connect with people, uh, birthday cake and um, a wine at, at dinner time and those things that normal people should be able to enjoy, I felt that I should be able to enjoy them too because I wasn't doing anything wrong or different. So I would go on restrictive diets. Uh, the most um, effective ones were usually uh, the low carb approach for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, but it was a lot of fluid loss rather than fat loss. And I think that resonates with me now and makes so much sense. I don't have a fat problem, accumulation problem. I, I, I have a, an inflammation and a fluid problem for sure. So I was trying to lose weight, but I didn't really have weight to lose. I had to get my inflammation under control. Yeah. And I, I think that's a big was. thing. Pardon? I forgot what the question was, but I hope I answered it. Oh, I think it was, uh, yeah, if you'd, if you'd um, sought help for this before, you knew what life it was. But I think you're yeah, absolutely, you hit on something there, that there is a big difference between weight loss fat loss and inflammation loss like there and they all have to be if you just want to lose weight anyone can lose weight anyone can do that because we know diet exercise reduce your calorie intake up your exercise you're going to lose weight but that doesn't work for us like we need to make sure that we are feeding our bodies enough moving them enough without being too restrictive in any way so it's a very slow process it's not going to happen overnight and I guess going to a doctor and getting the old magic eat eat less exercise more is um yeah is not the answer all right so my next question for, for you so when do you believe your lipedema developed so you have lymphedema as well so i don't know if you want to mm. talk about them differently or as the one condition yeah, I think um, I'm going to talk about them as the one condition because as I've I've only recently discovered that I also have lymphedema, but through that discovery, 
that seems to always have been the case because it's connecting a lot of dots for me with my adolescence and young adulthood. So the lipedema, that, sorry, the lymphedema is the reason why when I was dancing or when I was incredibly fit and healthy and slender, as slender as I could be, I would have days where I would be very puffy. Uh, so there's a, a picture that I put when I was doing some promotional modeling um, on my Instagram page and we wore gloves that came up to the top of your arms and you could see my arms bellowing out of these gloves. And that is fluid and inflammation that is not fat. And that was not my experience the day before wearing the very same gloves. So what I'm recognizing now is my lymphedema has always been there and my lipedema has been there since puberty. And I say since puberty because the column shape to my legs, uh, so I never had that defined knee area and then defined ankle area. So whilst I may not have been overweight or my legs weren't big, they didn't have those uh, lines that I was used to seeing in, in my peers. Yeah, that so lack of definition. Lack of definition, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, considering I was doing all these fancy things with my legs all day, you'd think that I'd have some leg muscles showing through, but that was not <laughs> the case for me. And neither in my arms as well, like, you know, I spent most of my time getting the audience to clap. And of course, when you're on stage, it's not like this. It's using like this for could be yeah. for 10 minutes at a time. Surely I would have shoulder muscles. So yeah. not the case. <laughs> um, so um, I definitely think I've had it since puberty. Uh, but what I, what I suspect has happened that I was very lucky when I had my pregnancy that I didn't notice progression of lipedema and that's quite surprising. Yeah. But after I had a virus um, a, a few years ago, I had a respiratory virus and it's sort of, I had some um, residual hyperthyroidism after this virus and I, I never understood that you could get um, a hormonal uh, fluctuation or issue after a virus but apparently you can yeah. and um, it settled after a while which was very good but I think that hormonal fluctuation actually pushed me into stage two to what I am now and I, I remember I remember after getting all of that health stuff sorted out I went to my doctor and I said I'm, I'm putting on weight and I don't understand why and some days I, it's so weird that I can't actually fit into any of the clothes in my wardrobe and then some days I can but but I'm still like I'm tracking upwards there's this incline in in weight and then the inflammation is a separate thing but it's still contributing to it as well and I was just really confused and and she and we were both puzzled really I mean she she wasn't the type of GP to be like oh well you just need to eat less or whatever. She she believed me. She genuinely believe, believed me and we went through all the hormonal things and everything seemed to be okay. So this was really validating to get a diagnosis to understand that it was outside of my control, I suppose, um, what was happening and that I wasn't doing anything wrong. Yeah, that is huge because I guess when you go to a doctor and they say, eat less, exercise more, like that just puts it back on you. And you're like, I'm doing everything. And I think the, and that's the biggest thing with a diagnosis like, like hyperthyroidism or hyperthyroidism and, um, and lipedema, we, we're realizing this is outside of our control. You know, there's only so much of this that we can control. And the thing is, if we don't know about it, we can't do anything about it. So it's only when we know what's actually going on and we can start then managing our conditions. So how do, this is a nice segue, how do you manage your, your conditions? How do you manage your life as Eva? Yeah, so um, when I first got my diagnosis, uh, Lipedema Surgical Solutions sort of sent me away with the three pillars, the anti-inflammatory diet, 
the manual lymphatic drainage and then the uh, compression garments. And um, the anti-inflammatory diet is really complex, as you would know. Um, everybody gets inflamed by different things. Uh, we all have those common, the things that are most common, like gluten and dairy and sugar. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a fairly sensible eater. I eat very healthily other than enjoying a birthday cake here and there and having an affinity for chocolate. So <laughs> other than that, you know, my diet is pretty good. So I was like, okay, well, I'm doing well. I'm doing well there, so that's good. MLD, um, I started getting manual lymphatic drainage and I actually really enjoy that part of the conservative management. Um, unfortunately, it comes at an expense and not everybody is privileged enough to be able to afford it. But, um, but I have an expert hands-on once a month, uh, you know, w with my body and I, I find that very beneficial. The, the most beneficial thing that I have found so far is wearing compression garments consistently. And I leaned into that because it was the one that I enjoyed the least. And it was the one that I struggled with the most. And, um, and, and you've said this before, Shell, um, the things that work are the things that you can do consistently. And so I, I really thought, how can I make this bearable and maybe enjoyable for myself? And that's where um, I decided to share a bit of my uh, compression garment wear uh, experience on my Instagram page. Um, so for now, I'm focusing on confidence in compression garments. Yeah, that is often. And have you changed? Because there are different types of compression and we will get a, a professional on at some stage to explain it properly. Um, but your experience so far, because you have changed garments, have is that right? Yeah, I have a bunch of off-the-shelf garments from different places from great companies, um, local companies as well. Um, and so I've really uh, tried quite a lot of brands. Um, what I'm finding at the moment, the one, the brand that I, my body responds to the most is the CZ Salus uh, brand. Um, and they use flat knit material, but I'm not sure whether you actually call it a flat knit garment. Regardless, um, whilst Lipidema Surgical Solutions and other um, lymphatic specialists tout the mm. must be custom made flat knit class two compression, in my mind, it's whatever gets you to where you need to be. And so um, I've been resistant to spend $800 on a flat knit custom made garment. And I've decided to because I'm still lucky that I'm a relatively standard size, even though I have some disproportion in my legs, I'm a relatively standard size. So I have chosen to go uh, the off the shelf garments and I wear them every single day, no break, no stop. Uh, obviously I don't wear them to bed, uh, but every single day I put on a compression garment most of the time it's a class two garment and my favorite is the CZ Salus and I can honestly say that it has made a world of difference not only for my lip edema but for my lymph edema as well and I was finding before because work clothes you know office clothes they're not stretchy I don't wear leggings to work or anything uh, that experience that I was having before I knew about lip edema of every now and then I would just all of a sudden wouldn't be able to fit into my wardrobe. And so I'd be like, well, what am I going to wear to work? I can't fit into any of my pants. I don't understand. Um, and now I'm wearing compression garments. So that fluctuation of size, whilst I still fluctuate the tiniest bit, it doesn't mean a change in clothing size for me. It doesn't mean having extra clothing sizes in my wardrobe from day to day or week to week. And that is, um, an amazing revelation. Amazing. 
For sure, because the mental strain of that as well, of not knowing if your clothes are going to fit from one day to the next. But that's, yeah, that's a massive hit. And so also um, with wearing compression, how has that affected your lip edema? Um, so it's really hard to tell because it's been such a short time. I started wearing compression garments in summer and I absolutely hated it. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad that I have a supportive husband because uh, he was um, happy for us to spend lots of money on getting air conditioning in our home just so that I could handle wearing compression garments during the day in a Queensland summer. <laughs> and now what we're a into man. winter. What a man, I know. Now we're into <laughs> winter and it's much easier for us to manage our disease in the winter time in the colder weather because we don't have that heat associated inflammation. So whilst I do attribute my compression wear to um, helping with pain and helping with inflammation with my lipedema, uh, it's hard to know to what extent because it's now the colder months where um, I'm relatively comfortable in my legs anyway yeah yeah and that drop in humidity too is, is a big help here in um tropical queensland absolutely so let me see so where to next for you so you said that um like you're doing conservative treatment now so what's next so i was going to be the conservative management girl that's what I was going to do. Surgery wasn't in my wheelhouse. And then I started following uh, a whole bunch of the lipedema community and started to see the realities of what surgery would look like. Um, now, the cost and being away from the family and being immobile while recovering, those are all, were all contributing factors why I, I wasn't going to do it in the first place. Um, but I changed my tune because I still have to go through menopause. I'm susceptible to being a high stress person and we know stress also can contribute to the progression of the disease. There's just so much uncertainty in my future about where I will end up with this disease. And I thought while I'm fit, healthy, mobile, and able financially and I guess mentally perhaps this is the right time to go through the process of surgery to see if I can nip it in the bud so to speak so um, I am booked in for my first surgery which will be on my lower legs with lipedema surgical solutions on the 1st of August which is not very That's far a month. Away. Oh, one month time. And then I am booked in for my second surgery, which will be hopefully will be upper legs 360. So uh, and that is on the 3rd of October. So that's nine weeks apart. Uh, I am going with Dr. Tio from Lipedema Surgical Solutions. And he was trained by Dr. Lekic and Dr. Lekic was trained by Dr. Heck, I believe, who's in Germany. And a lot of the uh, research um, for lipedema comes out of Germany, a lot of the initial research. So um, I'm excited to go with Dr. Tio. I've had very pleasant experiences in our, um, in our appointments so far. And he, with all of my conservative management efforts he is hoping that he will get my legs done within two surgeries which is quite amazing for someone as tall as I um, I'm uh, I'm 5'10 I believe although I think I'm shrinking which is <laughs> random um, but yes I am tall and not only am I tall my legs are incredibly long uh, the inseam of my leg legs is disturbingly long so um, <laughs> to have it done in two surgeries would be a real blessing and then in probably a year's time 10 or 12 
months time when that inflammation has gone down and I'm recovered, I will get my arms done and Dr. Teo will then revise the rest of me to see if he's missed any spots. Oh, that is so exciting. And are you, yes. how are you feeling? Are you feeling excited, apprehensive? No, this is your, how are you feeling? Yeah, I, I'm feeling all of those things. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The Depending on the day, yeah. Depending on the day. Um, uh, you know, as I said earlier, when people comment that, um, you know, my body doesn't look how they would expect someone with lipedema to look, sometimes then I question whether I should be investing so much in getting surgery and whether perhaps I'm overreacting and... Um, uh, that definitely plays into it. But then um, I just think about 12 months from now, how I will all but be uh, free of the daily struggles of lipedema. And I can use conservative management as a tool rather than a necessity. And that sounds really nice to me. Yeah, that does sound good. It's more of a self-care than a than a preventative measure, like a, yeah, yeah. I love that idea too. So I am going to ask you if you could go back and talk to your younger self, what would you say to her? Oh my gosh, this is such an important question. I, the one thing that I would definitely say is the word lipedema you know and and just to have imagine if I had the opportunity to learn what that was when I was 16 or 17 years old and instead of killing my body with um exercise and diets and diet pills um I could wear compression garments and go anti-inflammatory diet and um, I don't know where I would be, but I would certainly be in a much better place than I am now, uh, just with the knowledge that it's not my fault. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest thing. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's just the cards you've been dealt and we just got to make the most of them. But as a young teen being told this and hey there's an easy way to look after it and stop the progression oh uh, maybe we need to get into schools hey maybe we need to oh, to do something idea. within schools to um just get the word out there i never want to walk that's up to someone idea. and say hey here's a card i think you have this like that's not the approach at all but just have it in their vocabulary as much as anxiety, depression, you know, all of those have some of these, you know, lipedema in there as well. So make it just part of their vocabulary. Yeah, that without would... fear, without judgment, that would be yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Considering one in 10 women have this condition, like, it's you know... astounding the statistics, and it's so little known and little accepted it's astounding yeah yeah and I personally think it has to do with diet culture you know I think that's all intertwined with this like these unrealistic beauty standards the fact that the that the diet industry is the one industry that loses like like it's not successful like diets aren't successful, yet it um, makes like billions of dollars a year. Like it's just, it's crazy, right? Just feeding on our vulnerability and our our want to fit in, to be like yeah. the others. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, body image. Yeah, got a lot to answer for. And that's why we're here, Shell. Yay, that is. Let's have these Yay. conversations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 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 Oh, thank you so much for sharing. And I want to ask you, 
would you come back and talk to us after your first surgery? Oh, my gosh, I don't think you could stop me. <laughs> <laughs> look at him. Uh, let's, let's schedule you in. Okay, it won't be the yeah, day after, but, yes, I'll schedule, we'll schedule you in for sure. I've got your dates written yeah. down here now. So. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right, so Tiana, so thank, glad you, to be here. So, oh, thank you so much for joining me in this mission. And, um, yeah, yes. Just thank you. Um, you are, uh, I love your vibe and, um, yeah, love spending time with oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> I know, me too. I'm so excited for our next episodes coming up. Can't wait to bring together more community members and some experts as well. Yeah, it will be fun. Thank you so much for being with us today, Tiana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Shell. You too. Bye. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Life Edema podcast. Life edema and its symptoms vary from individual to individual. The opinions and advice voiced on this podcast are of a personal nature and used for educational purposes. Please take away from this podcast what resonates with you and please see your GP or preferred specialist for diagnosis and healthcare. We are Shelley and Tiana from the Life edema podcast. Until our next episode, bye for now.